Well, hello. My name is John Reese from Backstage Library Works. I'm the product manager for on-site services. I have with me today uh, Thomas Forsyth. He's a project manager for on-site services. Uh, the difference is I facilitate all the incoming on-site projects, and Thomas does the on-site projects. It's quite a big difference. Backstage does a number of different types of on-site services. Uh, Reclassification is one of our biggest. Uh, we also do RFID weeding and um, let's see, I had another one I, I was going to say and I forgot what it was. Oh, Inventory it, and uh, evaluations. Yeah. And so, but what we're going to talk about today primarily is the uh, reclassification project product and the project itself. And if you look at our, uh, our title here, it's reclassifying a library is like eating an elephant. And how do you eat an elephant? You eat an elephant one bite at a time. And that really explains the process of reclassifying. Now, throughout this uh, um, webinar here, there's, uh, there are times where we're going to pause for questions. You can feel free to go ahead and chat your questions to us, and we'll answer them uh, at that time. So I'm going to go ahead and kick it off here. We're going to, we're going to, this first slide is an overview of what we're going to do. I'm going to talk about what a reclassification is, uh, uh, the common choices that you can take, and reasons why you would do a reclassification. Then uh, we're going to get into the nitty gritty of actually doing a reclassification. I'm going to turn that over to Thomas Forsyth here, where he'll go over why would you do, uh, our things to think about before you do a reclassification, the basic outline of work, which is the important part. And then um, after that, I'll follow up by uh, by talking about uh, some of the challenges or some of the benefits that we have for reclassifying. Thomas also covered the challenges. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. So let's. Uh, I lost my. Here we go. So I'm just. This is the only slide I'm going to actually read to you because <laughs> I know you can all read here, but I just wanted to make sure we covered this. Uh, so a reclassification is the process of a change in a library catalog to an entirely new classification system or updating its existing classif classification system to current standards. It takes place in two steps. The first step is the data portion. And the data portion is done in-house uh, for Backstage. And that basically uh, what we do is we, we create the new classification record and put it in the mark record of the bibliographic record and then we are actually it's of the holdings record and then um, and then once that is all done we print labels from that and we turn it over to the on-site portion of the project and the on-site portion of the project is what we're going to talk about for the rest of the time here um, the biggest challenge for with reclassification is space if you think about this, what, what you have is a full, in most cases, a very full library. And what you need to do is take every one of those books and put them in a different place. So that, that involves a lot, of, uh, a lot of planning and a lot of steps to make this happen. One of the key elements that we're going to mention when we, when we go through, and Thomas will talk a bit more about this, is the need for space. And we call that swing space. And what that is, is that that is the free space that we can free up in the library to put books on, it's typically it's shelves, but not always, that cannot be put in their final destination. And the reason they can't be put in their final destination is because there's already a book in that final destination. Uh, and that book is scheduled to be pulled and reclassified, but it, it, at the time that you have a big portion of your collection done, there will not be space to put that book in. Swing space ideally would be 30% of your library free shelves. That doesn't usually happen. And so what we have to do is make that swing space. And uh, one of the most common is to shuffle books. We, we tighten up books in certain sections so we can free up a space because we know that there's going to be the new classification books are going to be going there next. The other way to do that is to, uh, some libraries actually have the facility to 
to build shelves or find rooms and put shelves in rooms so we have space there. And then the last, but uh, has been done before, way to do that is line those books up on tables in, a, in the wall or against the wall in order to, and we put them in an order. So the good thing about this is that every given point of this process, you should be able to find your book, whether it is in the old location, it's still under, let's say, Dewey Decimal, or it's in the new location, which is now classified in the final location on the shelves in the library, or it very well could be in swing space. At any given time, we'll know exactly where to get that book, and we'll also inform the library staff as to how to find that. Okay, there's a... Typically, reclassification is done for academic libraries when they go from Dewey Decimal System to uh, Library of Congress. In some cases for academic libraries, they'll have their own unique in-house library classification system and we'll have to move that to Library of Congress. Or in some cases, this is particularly in Europe, they have a Library of Congress classification but it is an older version or a modified version of, the, of Library of Congress and they've realized that they need to now um, they need to now change classification. They need to enrich it and make it bigger and stronger. Um, mm -hmm. uh, for uh, public libraries, what we're finding today, uh, you know, the standard um, classification system for a public library is Dewey Decimal. Uh, a lot of libraries are moving towards uh, a bookstore model, which is a subject-based model. And this works well for libraries that are not too big. If it's a large public library, this doesn't work that well. Um, and the reason is is that you, you have to complete you have to keep on redefining the subject headings and um, making them larger. So but uh, for many public libraries that are looking at BISEC at works, particularly if you have a lot of branches and the branches are somewhere between 10 and 50 thousand books, it works very well. If your public library is probably over 200,000, and that may be a stretch, and that's in one library, by the way, then um, the BISAC or bookstore model doesn't work as well as Dewey classification. At least that's our experience. So we've talked a little bit about uh, reclassifying and uh, why you do it. Here's uh, some other reasons for reclassifying. What happens is if you're uh, if you're using something like doing an academic and your library grows, then the call numbers become either repetitive or they become too long. Another very good reason that a lot of libraries don't think about is the actual cost of processing a Dewey Decimal book or a local book as opposed to uh, processing a Library of Congress book. And we're going to go, we have a couple slides that will illustrate that. We'll go over that in a little bit. Uh, another reason is, um, you know, most jobbers or vendors these days, if you want a shelf-ready book, they are, they are set up to do Library of Congress shelf-ready. Most of them are not, at least to my knowledge, set up to do um, a Dewey Decimal or some other classification for shelf-ready. And then finally, the, the most important reason is you want to make life easier on the patron and you want to make your, your collection more accessible. And uh, you'll see when you don't have the proper classification scheme, what can happen. So the slide on the left here is a Dewey Decimal number run amok. And you'll notice that the it's a you know 301 classification, but there were so many books in this collection that they had to define it as far as they could possibly go. And I can't remember, I counted that one time, I think it's 20-something uh, numbers past the Dewey Decimal, and you know that really becomes a little bit ridiculous for um, a patron and even a librarian at that point to try to figure out where this book should go and how to find it. Then we have the other other uh, side of the spectrum, and that is is the you know there's a, a if you do not if you do not granulate your uh, classification scheme, then you're going to run into the problem of having too many like books together. And so you see here that all the 759.13s with the cutter of HOP are all together. Um, that's not bad right there, four or five books, but 
we've run into collections where there were stacks of the same number, and that was really problematic. It was problematic for us to do the reclassification. If you can imagine trying to find that book, it would really be problematic. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about the cost of uh, current cataloging. Now, this is a, these slides are a little bit outdated, but um, it hasn't gotten any better, and if it had, if anything, it's gotten worse. Uh, we had a, a study done. Um, we didn't have it done, but it was done by Rosalind Rayford. Thomas, I think she's from Duke University, right? Yes, yeah, she's the head cataloger at Duke University. This study was done just after we finished reclassifying their collection back in 2008. Yeah, and. Uh, and what she did was she compared uh, processing Dewey to uh, Library Congress. And so I'm going to go ahead and uh, move on and show you what the, what the results were. So the biggest caveat, I mean, the process is the same. You get the new book in, you check it into the ILS, you check to see if it's in the system. Then you take a look at all the elements of that MARC record and try to make, uh, make sure that it's, it's what you need. The problem with Dewey Decimal was about 60% of them required uh, classifying in-house. And it took four to eight weeks, and that takes a lot of time. Only 40% of them could be found uh, in copy cataloging. I suspect that's even worse now, but I don't know. We haven't done a study on that recently. So the end result was to process a book and put a, a classification mark on it costs over $5. We did the same study for Library of Congress uh, classification. Same process, only the problem, uh, what happens is that it's not a problem here. This is a good thing. By the time they get to checking uh, the book for uniqueness in the collection, particularly the library scheme, only 11% of these books needed to be done in-house. 89% of these books could be done through copy cataloging. And so you can imagine the cost savings uh, doing, being able to do 89% of your collection through uh, copy cataloging as opposed to coming up with your own classification scheme. Uh, to give you an idea of how that has changed over the last seven years, the University of Kent in Canterbury had a five-month backlog of books waiting to be cataloged before they updated to modern spec for Library of Congress. Uh, once they updated to modern spec and were able to get more of their books uh, done under ready to shell from their publishers, they cut that down to a two-day turnaround time to get books onto the shelves. Yeah, so you know it, it does make a big difference, and that time obviously is money to, to your library staff or your library. Plus, it's a, you know, if you can get your book out in a couple of days as opposed to months, your patrons are going to be so much happier. Uh, and then yeah. that kind of leads to the next benefit of uh, doing a, a reclassification, and that's the ability to do shelf-ready uh, distribution. And shelf-ready, of course, is when you, uh, you have your vendor or your distributor do as much of the uh, classifi classification as well as uh, subject to uh, um, assignment and that they can for the uh, book. And so basically when the book comes in, you're ready to, there's a few things you need to do within the, the library system to add it to your system. but you don't have to spend all kinds of time reclassifying or adding subjects uh, and making modifications to the MARC record. So libraries really look forward to uh, being able to do that when they can, and it really does bring the, the time between a book being accessioned into the library and a book going out on shelf uh, considerably. Usually, you know, two to five days if everything's going right for the library to get it out on a shelf, and that's pretty good. The last thing I want to talk about before I turn this over to Thomas is uh, unique classification systems. This is the Richardson classification system from Princeton. And the interesting thing about uh, this is, you know, our Dewey classification system has a whole number and a decimal to the right, and it makes sense even though it can get out of hand, particularly when you have over 20 decimals on your uh, classification on the, on the right. But in Richardson, they actually had the uh, Dewey on both sides. So if this, if another book came in and it was a similar, uh, it very well could be classified one six seven five eight nine or five eight one dot three one nine six two. 
And so what this did, the big problem for the library here was it was virtually impossible to find the darn book. And then uh, even when you did find it and you're ready to reshelve it, it was almost inevitably shelved out of place. So uh, that's kind of the reasons why we would do classification. And uh, we're going to turn a little bit of time over to our participants here to see if, we, if they have any particular questions that we can answer. So uh, we'll give you a few minutes to chat away here, and either me or Thomas will pick up and try to answer your question. And I want everybody to and uh, just be aware you'll need to use the chat feature to ask these questions because uh, your personal microphones aren't turned on. While we're uh, waiting on questions, I'll just go into a little more detail on the Richardson classification system from Princeton. Um, about a third of their books were in that particular system. It was developed back in the 1930s uh, by a professor at Princeton University. And as John was saying, it was a decimal on both sides of the decimal point. Um, so the big headache of that is most people would try to shelve that first number as a whole number. So as you can imagine, a large number of their books were out of place. And beyond that, the collection wasn't in the normal schematic throughout the building. It was sort of broken up based on um, where people wanted the books near their offices. So when the students would come into the building, it was very confusing for them to try and find anything. Um, once we were done, the building was in Library of Congress order from top to bottom, so it was a lot easier for students to find the book they were looking for. Well, here's a question, Thomas. Oh. So Carla Jurgemeyer says, do uh, you have general estimates on the time it takes to complete a reclassification project based on number of books? Yes, we do. Um, Typically, uh, we can reclassify about 35 books per hour per person that we have on a project. Um, so reclassifying about 100,000 books will usually take about two to three months. Um, the Princeton project took a little over a year. That was over 700,000 books, but we were also uh, integrating it into an existing 1.6 million book collection that was already in Library of Congress. Now, one of the things you, that uh, you can to consider when you're when you're trying to figure out how much time you have to do this, is that um, it all kind of depends on resources at that point. So, you know, we configure uh, reclassification with eight to ten texts, but if you need to go a little bit quicker, we would add more text to it. I mean, the process is going to be the same. We're going to get about 35 books an hour, but if you have 15 people doing it instead of 10, then that process is going to go much faster. Princeton and Duke University probably have the largest crews of the projects we've run. Um, each of those uh, were around 28 to 32 people, uh, plus project management staff. All right. Thomas, you want to go ahead and take over? Yeah. So again, my name is Thomas Forsyth. Um, I'm our central project manager for on-site projects. I've been doing this work for the last eight years, um, and I'll be covering the next couple sections of the presentation. So part four, things to do leading up to reclassification. These are things that you'll want to consider in advance of the project starting, uh, just to make it run more smoothly and have everything just the way you want it as the project's going on. Um, the first is weeding. Um, this can either be done by your staff, because every book that you realize you don't want and get, out, get rid of is a book you're not paying uh, to be reclassified that you're sort of wasting money on. Um, also, if you don't have time to weed your collections, but you, if you can at least create a list of the items you want removed, you can give those to us and we can get those pulled from the shelves rather than reclassifying them for you. Um, or you, we can assist you with making a list like that. Um, preferences for new classification. This is things like, do you want cutter numbers uh, on your new labels, like copy one, copy two, volume one, volume two? Um, do you want reference? Oh, John, you, sorry. I, I did that accident. Um, you, um, do you want reference to say REF above the label or R, or do you want it to say anything at all? Do you want additional stickers applied to some collections along with the new labels? Things like that so we can make sure everything is right to the specs that you prefer. Um, also, what font do you want? Do you want it in bold? Um, Flow of collection post reclassification. How do you want your library organized? Do you want, uh, the if you're switching to Library of Congress, do you want the A's to start on the first floor or do you want them to start on the top floor? Um, do you want them broken up in an odd way uh, based on 
say there's uh, a certain area of the building that religion tends to use and you want those books to stay where they are. Um, labels tag placement, do you want the new labels just to go directly over the old labels or do you want them all in the exact same spot on every book? Um, if a book has a narrow spine, do you want it in the top left-hand corner of the front of the book or do you want it in the bottom left-hand corner? Um, locating swing space. Again, John discussed this earlier. Typically, we prefer to have 30%, but that's very hard to do in most libraries. Um, so other options are uh, installing additional shelving, um, renting book trucks, uh, Princeton especially, rented just about every available rentable book cart on the East Coast uh, for their project because they had very limited free space in their building. Um, we also, uh, in a worst case scenario, uh, can set books in piles on floors in empty rooms and have them organized by letter group or whatever other uh, classification system we're doing. Um, and, but we usually try to make sure that those only are like that for extremely limited periods of time to prevent uh, limited access. Um, also, bundling with other work. Uh, one nice thing about these projects is we are handling every book. Uh, which can drastically cut down on the pricing of if you wanted to bundle reclassification with something like RFID tagging. Uh, most of your costs with a project like this are tied up in management and just the hiring and staffing fees. And when you've got um, all of that already taken care of with one large project, it drastically cuts down on the pricing of doing anything else along with it, such as inventory or uh, weeding or anything else. So basic on-site reclassification outline, you basically have the, these phases for any reclassification project. You have the design phase, which is essentially what I just discussed with setting things up, um, essentially writing the contract for you, saying this is how you want things done, this is exactly how it's going to break down. Preparation is what I'll be going over next. That's what the project management will do once they're on site, and helping prepare everything for setup. Uh, implementation is when we're actually going through and uh, reclassifying all the materials and moving them around. And we track uh, during that process to help you know on a day-to-day -day basis where things are going. And of course, wrapping everything up. So initial mapping. Um, once the project management is on site, the first thing they'll do is map your library. Um, they'll color code everything to show where the current collections are. And uh, they'll then create a secondary map showing where they're going to go. Now in this case, this was the University of Kent. Uh, they were on a simplified Library of Congress call number system with a few random tweaks uh, to fit their individual collections. Now, the problem with the University of Kent is they actually uh, quadrupled in size since their original library was built. Uh, they've added on four extensions since that time, and the library got so large that they were just having repeating call numbers all over the place. So they realized both for that reason and the fact that they wanted their distributors to be able to provide them books already in the new Library of Congress classification system, um, they needed to move up to full spec because when you get a pre-made Library of Congress book from your distributor, it's typically only in the full classification system to modern standards that the Library of Congress provides. So this is post-reclassification. You'll see that between one and the other, the colors are changing slightly. That's how each of the letter groups changed from one to the other. Uh, as we switched from, um, from shortened spec to full spec in Library of Congress. Uh, this is a pivot table. Uh, we also created these for each project. It shows how it breaks down from the original classification system to the new classification system. This is a nice, easy way to visually see what's moving and what's staying roughly where it is. Everything that's highlighted on this pivot table is a book that is staying where it was in the first place. Um, the group in the middle is the middle floor of the building. Everything that was in that red box was staying where it was. Uh, then we create section headers. Section headers um, are essentially what the very first book in every bay of the building should be. Uh, when we say bay, that means each bookcase. Um, so basically, we cut these strips out, and each one is tacked on to the first shelf of every bay so that when you're walking through the building, you can see exactly which groups are going to go into each section of the building. And then we create an order of processing. This is basically the timeline for the project. This shows uh, which areas are being done in which order, uh, roughly how many items will be tagged at each stage, um, which areas will be open for final location at that point. Um, that means the books that are actually uh, available to go right where they belong at every stage of the grouping. So if something doesn't fall in that area, you know it's got to go either into swing space or overhead space. Um, some libraries, your top shelves or bottom shelves are usually free, so we can put books where they belong, at least there, if nowhere else. 
Um, and then of course, uh, how much is going into swing space at each stage and how long each stage should take. So uh, after that, um, another thing to be thinking about is the challenges involved with these projects. Um, the first is minimizing needed swing space. We do not want a library to have to provide more than the bare minimum that they have to for swing space because we know how difficult it can be. Um, that's one nice thing about that order of processing. It says exactly how much room is needed at each stage. Um, we were able to provide that for Princeton University, like I said, so they, weren't, they didn't have to rent all those cards for the full project. It was only at the really heavy use stages that they had to rent all those. And then as it petered out, they were able to slowly return those to the vendor. Um, repeating call numbers. Uh, again, repeating call numbers can slow down a reclassification project because we use three main match points. Uh, the first is a call number uh, of the book. The second is the barcode of the book. And the third is the title of the book. And of course, call number is the easiest thing to be able to say, that's the book I want. So if you have thousands of books with the exact same call number, it makes it a little more difficult. Uh, same with if you've got a percentage of your building that doesn't have barcodes, um, that can cause some trouble. Um, it doesn't mean that it's impossible, it just takes a little longer. Um, and if you are missing a lot of barcodes, that's another thing we can provide is to actually be barcoding materials as we go along. Um, construction events. Um, you would be amazed how many projects we've done that we're having major construction on the buildings. Uh, Duke University, their top floor of their main building, they were jackhammering it uh, while we were there. Um, Elizabeth City, they tore the roof off over our heads while we were there. Uh, the reason for that is it's a lot easier sometimes to push through a large project like this if it's bundled with other um, major projects for a library. So a lot of the time we get bundled together with construction projects. Uh, just letting us know what's going to go on in advance is, really helps with our planning. Um, same with events. Uh, especially in public libraries, you get a lot of story times for little kids, making sure we know when those are occurring, uh, when the library might be closed for special events so that we can just plan around that is very useful. Um, dust, uh, especially in academic libraries, um, you tend to have areas of the collection that aren't used as much. Um, Princeton University, their top floor was mainly religion, but there was already a divinity school on campus, so most of the divinity students used that library, so their religion books didn't get touched as much. They had a really thick coating of dust over them. Um, there was also a private collection that wasn't open to the public at Birmingham Central Library. So most of those books had a pretty thick coating of dust too. So we were paid to go through and actually clean those books with a HEPA filter vacuum uh, before we handled them for the main project so that everyone knew everything was perfect once we left. Um, covers resistant to adhesive. One thing to keep in mind in advance is if you want to use label protectors over your labels, um, it's not that expensive to go ahead and just add a label protector to every single book, and it's a great way of making sure everything stays exactly the way you want it for as long as humanly possible. But you'll always want to have some label protectors on hand just for those covers that are resistant to tags. Every librarian has dealt with this. It's a real headache uh, when you're dealing with like a cloth cover um, that labels just don't want to stick to. Um, so label protectors are really useful for that. Um, and then these final two issues, problem books and keeping staff updated, I'll be covering in the next couple of tabs. So problem books fall into a couple of different categories. The first is no records found. Now, when we identify problem books, we flag them so that you can see in advance exactly what you're dealing with. Yellow means we couldn't find a label for that item in our sheets. Now, because there tend to be a lot of these, because this is whenever a technician has an issue finding something, um, any project management staff on site are going to go ahead and double check these against a master file to see if maybe the call number on the side of the book was wrong, or maybe uh, it was incorrectly barcoded, or um, maybe it was uh, recorded as being part of the wrong collection code. So we were looking at one set of collection codes when it should have been another. Uh, but anything that can be tagged will be tagged, and then uh, it'll be marked down with a note if we still just know this has no label at all before it's handed over to library staff. Um, if it's clear right off the bat this is a barcode issue, or we'll flag it with a green flag. Um, this is typically if the barcode was torn out by a patron, um, and so there's just no barcode at all. And of course, if you want us to, we can resolve these as we go. And then call number title mismatches. Um, call number can refer to a few different things. Um, if our people are scanning it, um, we record it as different things in our database. Um, if we have a leftover label, it's saved as a label no book. If we have a book without a label, it's recorded as a book no label. So if one of my people is scanning in something and realize, 
oh, I think this is a book, no label. And they scan the barcode and realize, oh, it says label, no book. Obviously, there's a label somewhere. I just don't know where it is. They might flag it as a call number mismatch because clearly there's something going on with the call number. Um, and again, usually if that's the case, the project manager will go ahead and take care of these. Um, it can also refer to if we are on site um, doing a project where we realize, oh, the new call number assigned to this just isn't correct. Um, right now we're in the San Mateo County Library System. Um, because they assigned a lot of the call numbers themselves, um, the, there's occasional just human error that pops up, um, like uh, making a Jim Henson biography under Jimi Hendrix, because uh, the HEN just auto-filled in for them. Um, we flag those as call number mismatches so they know those need to be corrected um, at some point so that it doesn't go back on the shelf under the wrong call number. Uh, title mismatches are exceedingly rare. That usually only happens when an original uh, call number was being assigned. Um, the cataloger was making two records at the same time and they accidentally transposed titles between records, such as um, the Iliad getting swapped with Moby Dick. So everything else is correct, but the title is wrong in the record and we realize that needs to be fixed. And if that's the case, we will write it on the flag so that you know that's what needs to be corrected. Um, additional problem flags, sets requiring additional labels. Um, one thing to always keep in mind when we're doing a reclassification project, we really need to know how many books are in your library and where they're going and what they are. So if you have a really, really large volume set um, that only has one record and it just sort of says, this is 1930- dash, it doesn't say how many volumes are in it. When we print those labels, we're only going to have one label for that set. So when we get on site and see, oh, there's 30,000 books here. That can throw off our numbers a little bit. Um, we can print additional labels on site to correct those. But if you know you have a really, really large volume set like that, it's, it's exceedingly useful to go ahead and count it and let us know how many are in it so we can go ahead and print those labels. Um, the worst case for that was at Princeton University. They had one uh, collection of congressional records. Uh, it did fill up half of a large room, and we only had one record for it. So going through and fixing that took a little bit of additional shifting. One of the um, you're, oh, yes, John? One of the things we do to, um, to help prevent the, these kind of problems is if we, have, uh, if we can, we'll send somebody on site to do a sample of your collection. Be a random sample, and that kind of tells us. Uh, for instance, we did that at Princeton, and mm -hmm. we knew before they knew that about 20% of that collection was going to need to be barcoded. Uh, so when uh, if if you're working with a vendor um, to have this done, make sure you line up a, a visit if it's at all possible, so they can come out and check your collection. Right. Um, year mismatches, especially with Library of Congress, sometimes you may want a very specific year on a book, but the year that the Library of Congress assigned it may not be the one you think it will be, uh, because typically the year assigned by the Library of Congress is whenever they were notified that book was going to be created. That might have been three years before the book was actually published. So um, if, a if a label's put on something and you're like, oh, I wanted this to be 1997, but it says 1995. We can correct those as we go if you let us know in advance that you want us to look for specific things. Um, so far, Duke University has been the only group that's asked for that. And of course, other. If there's something unique to your collection, we can always be flagging it as well if you want us to watch out for it. And then keeping library staff updated. There's a lot of different ways we do this. Uh, we send daily updates. Uh, the daily update reports um, include all the barcodes for each group that we've done that day. So we say, here's all of the label notebooks that we had today. Here's all of the books that were flipped to final location. Uh, here's all the other problem books we had. Um, we send a weekly report saying, here's where we are, here's what's going on, here's issues we're facing, here's where we're going next. And we send monthly updates that say um, what was done that month, what you're being charged for, and just a basic breakdown of all of our quality checks. Um, and then usually for reclassification, we'll also have a whiteboard like this in the um, circulation era area so that as books are coming in, they know what to set aside first that hasn't already been flipped uh, so that we can get those reclassified for you before we leave. All right, so we're going to pause again for questions now. Um, if anyone has any questions about challenges or uh, the implementation phases, um, and then after that, John will take the last couple of areas. Yeah, and we'll just wrap, be wrapping it up at that point, so we're really close to being finished. Mm -hmm. 
And if anyone joined us since the last question period, again, we, your microphones are not active. So if you have questions, uh, please type them into chat below. Thomas Wilder, uh, I have a couple of questions that are things that I want you to explain while they're sure. um, you know, thinking about questions they may have. Uh, first thing I want you to talk about is flipping the call number. Yes. So um, one thing you may be wondering is, how does my uh, catalog get updated during this process? Typically, your IT department is going to be handling that. Um, once we upload all the MARC records for your project, it'll have both the old and the new call number in that MARC record. So typically, what they'll do is create some kind of macro that can identify a barcode from our report, say, I've pulled up this record, I'm flipping, I'm identifying the old call number, I'm identifying the newcomer, and I'm essentially flipping their location so that that new call number is live in my catalog. Now, some uh, areas may decide, oh, we don't want to do it every single day. We don't need to. Uh, we'll do it maybe after you finish the adult collection for us in this branch, or we'll do it uh, maybe halfway through the project, or in some cases, they'll just wait until the very end and just flip everything all at once. Um, Any way is fine, whatever works for you. Um, we've even been at one location where they just had both call numbers live throughout the whole project and then just deactivated the old call number at the end um, so that a student would know up front what they were looking for in either classification. Um, again, if you're a large institution, it's usually best to try and do it every day if you can, and we will be providing those reports to you every single day so that you can flip them if you want to. Did you have another question, John? Yeah, I want, I want you to talk about uh... When you put together the order process, which is the step-by-step -step, uh, process of how you're going to do this project, how do you determine where to start? Well, typically what I do is I use the pivot table breakdown that I showed you earlier um, to identify which area of the building has the maximum number of books staying in that area. Um, because the whole point of the order of processing is to limit your needed swing space. Um, usually for a, a Dewey to Library of Congress project, um, religion, because it's in the 200s, will usually flip over to roughly where the bees are going to go. Um, so you can typically make it pretty easy um, to start there. And then from that point on, you're basically leapfrogging to whichever area is similarly open or going into an already open area. And you're, you're just looking through that pivot table trying to figure out which order you can go through to have the minimum number of books that are lost and, um, well, not lost, but not able to go where they belong, where they have to go into swing space. Now, we're going to pause a little bit because we've been talking too much and giving <laughs> folks a chance to ask questions. So if you have anything about that process, this is a good time to uh, ask. Mm -hmm. And we will have one more question point at the very end. It's common, so we're going to oh, move. Ted, Ted Waller is typing right now. Oh, great, I, I missed that. There we go. Uh, when processing, do you go by the order of the new labels or the order of books on the shelf? Uh, we go in the old call number order uh, when reclassifying. So if we were to tackle, say, the 200s from Library of Congress, we'd start with 200, work our way up to 299, and then hop to whichever area we were doing next. Good question. Mm -hmm. I'm not seeing any additional typing, so John, if you want to go ahead and go on to your area, we can have one more questionnaire at the very end. Now we've covered most of this stuff, uh, but I'm just going to re-mention it, and this will not take long. One of the things you need to remember or need to think about when you're doing a reclassification is that every one of those books are being, is being touched. Every book in your library is going to be picked up by somebody, and uh, something's going to be done with it. <clears throat> This is a great opportunity for a library to do things that they just can't get to. And I know how difficult it is to get through an inventory in a library. Well, if you're going to do a reclassification, you should be doing an inventory at the same time. And, you know, uh, weeding, this is an opportunity to do weeding, too. We do a set of weeding automatically, and what we it's really not weeding on our part. What we do is we identify books that have problems, and we... Uh, we bring them to the library. Uh, and then another thing that a real benefit from, from this process is all those problem books, and Thomas went over exactly what types of problems we run into, 
they're going to be identified, set aside, and your library is going to have a chance to evaluate that. And then some of the one of the nice side benefits, and, and I'll just we'll have some nice pictures to show some of this stuff, but one of the nice benefits is, is that for a period of time, your library is going to look like it's brand new. It's going to be everything's going to be clean and it's going to be in order. And then of course you're going to let your students use it. But uh, beyond that, it's it's going to be really nice when you're when we're done. And then the last thing that is really quite uh, we we haven't talked about it much, but that's a real benefit is this is an opportunity for your library to say take a look at their collection, determine where that collection is growing, and make the appropriate or leave I should say the appropriate space for that. So let's, as an instance, uh, if you know that your collection in art history is going to be growing uh, immensely in the next couple of years, then instead of leaving, uh, you know, 10% on your shelf for uh, growth, you know, we can work with the library to leave 20% on the shelf. Now, the quicker we know that, the easier this is to do because we're making these plans when we step foot in your library. But, you know, um, it, like I said, it's a good opportunity for you to make that library look exactly like you would like it to. Um, we talked about, I briefly talked about inventory. The, the key here is that every book is being touched. You might as well, and we're scanning every book, and at this point you might as well compare it against your collection. We have a set of reports that we can print out for you. Uh, that tells you exactly what's, you know, what books are in your database that are not in the collection. And actually, we have reports that can tell you what books are on the shelf. Well, actually, they will never get it to get back to the shelf at that point. But we'll also find books that are not in your database, and they'll be set aside as problem books. But it's a, it's a good time for you to do an inventory at this point. Weeding. Um, we do a lot of weeding anyhow. We do a percentage, probably, what is the average, Thomas, about 20 books a day per person? Uh, no, the, typically we will do uh, 12 books per member of our staff for free. Um, and it's very rarely more than that unless the library has specific recommendations that they need. Um, we've done things, of course, pulling from lists for libraries. Uh, we've been at one branch that requested anything older than a certain date be pulled because they were looking for just new modern books that, that were up to date for the students that were using their collections. Um, but again, the, the ones that we will always pull for you are if we find broken bindings, um, if the books are falling apart on the shelves, uh, if there's black mold especially. Um, you'd be amazed how often black mold shows up in collections. I usually say you're probably going to find at least one instance of it in every branch. And I, most branches I've been to, the, the staff always say, no, 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 not our collection, never here. Um, and usually that's where we find a worst instance of it because uh, no one wants to believe it's their collection. It's always other people. Yeah. Um, but it's something you really have to watch out for. So we're going to run across these and we'll bring them to your attention if nothing else. We don't, we don't actually weed them. We give them to you and you, you determine whether you want to keep them, repair them, or weed them at that point. Well, one of the things you missed, Thomas, was uh, bookworms. Mm -hmm. That's another thing. We uh, we've only found two cases of that so far in the, in the library you've done, thankfully. But yeah, when we do find breakouts of those, we notify staff immediately. But it's kind of it's interesting because you hear about this and you never think, well, no, but my library doesn't have that. But you'd be surprised, particularly the mold. Libraries have mold. Um, mm -hmm. Again, then we uh, another benefit is the identification of problems that you have in your in your library, books that are problem books. We give you it gives you an opportunity to fix those problems. And then uh, here's a nice picture of uh, Thomas leaving the library. Here it's actually not of Thomas, but this is how he left this this library. And the stacks are nice and clean and straight. Uh, it looks really nice. And we we do a light dusting if the books need it. Uh, so that's another benefit that you get from uh, doing a reclassification. And that's really it. Uh, it's a great process. It is one, one step or one bite at a time. It really does take some detailed planning. Uh, recommendations is that when you're going to do a classification or a reclassification, make it a full-time job project. It's not, a, it's not a, something that's done well with with temps and doing it part time. Now it could be done okay with temps, but it's really is it really needs full attention and dedication. So 
I, I'm hoping that you have a few more questions. We're here to answer them. And uh, other than that, I think that we're we've uh, pretty much done with this webinar presentation. I see a couple of people typing below, so we'll answer your questions as they pop up. So Ted Waller says, what are the rules of thumb for the library to estimate project costs? John, you want to field that one? It costs, depending on the library and the complexity and the size, anywhere from a dollar a book to a dollar and a quarter. I've seen it more and I've seen it less, but that is kind of the range of what it costs if you're going to outsource this process. And of course, the more books that you're handling at a time, the lower the overall cost. Okay. And Carla says, what is the small size project you've done on site, or have you worked with a library that has done reclassifying in stages? Um, yes, <laughs> to, to both. Um, probably the lowest number we've handled was for a pilot project um, at, a, at a library in New Jersey where they wanted us to come in and sort of show them what we could do. And me and one other project manager went on site and just went ahead and reclassified their reference collection, which was just 5,000 books. And we just uh, knocked that out over a couple days and put it in new order. And um, they hired us on to do the rest of their library shortly thereafter. Um, in terms of a large scale project, um, probably the smallest I've done was about 100,000. John, what's the smallest our company's done as a whole? Well, I'm thinking of Oxford. Those were pretty small collections. Right? Oh, that's right. Oxford was smaller. Oxford was 60,000 bucks uh, for their um, history faculty library collection that we did yeah and so that and we've had uh, they average about a hundred thousand to a couple million but this day and age it's a lot of reclassification of a collection within a collection so for instance uh, we mentioned Princeton uh, we did a portion of that collection they they had well over two million books but we only did about eight hundred thousand right Thomas uh, it was 700,000 books, and then there's 1.6 million that was in Library of Congress, and the two had to merge together yeah. afterwards. So, yeah, every book in the building had to move. Um, as for reclassifying in stages, the main thing to keep in mind if you want to do a chunk of your library at a time, um, you, it's a big expense to uh, get set up in the first place. So if you're paying to have a project manager come on site, hire a staff, train them, um, get everything set up, reclassify for a while, shut everything down, leave, and then have to come back, you're paying those setup costs over and over and over again, which is drastically going to drive up your overall price. Yeah. Um, so if you're going to do everything, it's better to do it all at once, or if you're doing multiple branches, just have us knock them out one after another. Some libraries don't have that luxury, but if you, if you can avoid doing it in stages, that would be our recommendation. And then our also, mm -hmm. it is a full-time job, like I said before, so... We'll get somebody out there working directly with your staff, and then we're going to hire people. And the background of that, we'll we'll start with the library, but we'll have educated people do this. It's not a it's not a, a temp job. We don't go to temp agencies to hire these people. And yeah. then um, and then we they work eight hours a day. It's a temporary job in that it's only maybe two or three months, but it is a full time job while they're there. Anyone else have any other questions that you'd like to ask while we're here? Ted, if you want to talk a little bit further about cost, uh, there's my email address as well as Thomas's and Backstage's mm -hmm. number. The smaller your library is, the, uh, the larger the price, because now you're spending more on management than you're spending on reclassifying. So. That's another reason why not to break it up in chunks, uh, Carla. The more the merrier for uh, cost. Well, I, uh, if anybody else has any questions, you can either uh, send them to us via email or give us a call at the backstage. I want to tell you how much I appreciate your time an effort and if you do have a project coming up and you have questions you don't have to necessarily hire us to answer questions over the phone contact either me or Thomas our sales rep and we can answer some of those questions for you or feel free to send either one of us an email 
If you are interested uh, in having Backstage do an assessment, we'd be happy to work with you. We'll come on out and do an assessment of your collection if you want us to. And uh, we'll come up with a price quote for you and see if it will work for you. Okay, I think we're done. I again appreciate your time, and uh, I'll let our, uh, the guy who manages his website shut this down when he's ready. Thank you very much. Thank you.